Thanks for the biographical introduction. Good morning. Uh, Hello. I, I, for us, it's good morning, I think, here in Tokyo. For you, it must be evening, I think. Yes. So welcome and thank you so very much for uh, coming uh, to uh, give us this fun. This, uh, I think uh, I have very high expectations because of uh, your previous uh, talks I've heard. And we had uh, Charles Ak, uh, give us a talk yesterday. And I think you know Charles very well. Yes. And I think the time didn't work out, but it was very fantastic yesterday. And uh, thank you for your suggestion for next year. I, I, we will definitely do the 200 years of uh, second law. And also I, uh, we will have a, a bigger Ludwig Wolfsmann forum next year as well. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. And thank you very much for the invitation. For those who don't know me here, I'm Nicole Younger Halpern. I'm a theoretical physicist. I work in quantum thermodynamics. And during the course of this hour, I'm going to talk about what quantum thermodynamics is. I'm a Quix fellow at Quix, the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science, which is a joint center that's shared by the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the University of Maryland. I'm going to be talking about quantum steampunk, which is explained in this book, and I'll introduce the concept here as well. So I spent a year studying physics here in Waterloo, which is a city in Canada near Toronto. Waterloo excels in theoretical physics, tech startups, and winter. Lots and lots of winter. Eventually the winter ends, and in the spring, one day for a study break, I visited the Waterloo Public Library. There I found this novel by the Canadian poet Jay Ruzeski, The Wolsenberg Clock. One scene takes place actually in Austria during the 1800s. There's an inventor who's standing on a balcony, gazing down onto the ballroom below, which he's converted into a workshop. He and his family members build automata, the clockwork driven elephants and snakes and so on. So this inventor is gazing down on his miraculous creations with his overcoat trailing out behind him. And the atmosphere is just palpable. And for good reason. Soon afterward, I learned that I'd encountered steampunk. Steampunk is a genre of literature, art, and film. Steampunk stories take place during the Victorian era, when the Industrial Revolution has been coming. Some of the earliest factories are belching smoke. London is full of smog and Sherlock Holmesian mysteries. Railroads are cutting across the American West for the first time, and people wear you know, waistcoats or petticoats. Against this backdrop, are futuristic technologies, such as automata, time machines, flying ships, and submarines. Another Canadian poet, Douglas Featherling, has supposedly said, steampunk is a genre that imagines how different the past might have been had the future come earlier. You might have encountered this steampunk novel, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, it's one of the first steampunk works. It was written during the 1800s. But steampunk is very much with us still. The invention of Hugo Cabret was a New York Times bestseller in the early 2000s. Enola Holmes was one of the first films released on Netflix due to the pandemic. It's about Sherlock Holmes's little sister, Enola. The film was a hit. I loved it. And the sequel came out last November. The Nevers is a show on HBO about Victorian women who have supernatural gifts. These works reach back to the past and ahead to the future. This fusion of old and new creates a wonderful sense of nostalgia, and adventure, romance, and exploration. So fans dress up in steampunk costumes with top hats and goggles and gears and gather at steampunk conventions for the sake of a fantasy. But the fantasy of steampunk is becoming a reality 
in my area of research. As I mentioned, I'm a theoretical physicist. I work at the intersection of three fields, quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. Information science is the study of how efficiently we can process information, solve computational problems, and more. Quantum physics, people here have probably studied in core physics or engineering or chemistry courses. It has a reputation for counterintuitive behaviors such as entanglement. Scientists and engineers are leveraging these behaviors to build quantum computers, which will process information in ways that classical technologies, such as my laptop here, cannot. Thermodynamics, we probably also studied in core courses, but I found that physicists often don't remember quite what thermodynamics is, and many students never learn why we should care about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, plain and simple. It was developed during the Victorian era in large part to describe the work, as we just heard from Gerard, performed by a cutting edge technology of the day, steam engine. Today's cutting edge technologies include quantum devices, which are very, very different. So we need to re-envision the thermodynamics of the 1800s for the 21st century. We need to ask how quantum engines would look and what they could achieve. We need to reach back to the past and head to the future. The resulting fusion of old and new I call quantum steampunk. So a genre of science fiction is coming to life at the intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. Let's briefly review each of these components to ensure everyone's on the same page and then put them together. Information science is the study of how efficiently we can perform information processing tasks. Those include solving computational problems, such as calculating a satellite's trajectory, communicating information, such as over the web, securing information cryptographically, and storing information in memories. We live in the information age. We process data from experiments. We use computational clusters in our departments or national labs. But what is information on a fundamental level? It's basically the ability to distinguish between alternatives. Say that a friend asks you if the pub down the street, in Victorian London, of course, is open or closed. You peer through the window and see either foaming mugs or cleaned mugs sitting upside down on the counter. You've gained the ability to distinguish whether the pub is open or closed. You've gained information. We measure quantities in units, such as seconds or meters. What's the basic unit of information? It's called the bit. It's the amount of information you gain. If you have no idea of the answer to a yes or no question, and you learn the answer. Say that when your friend asks about the pub, the pub has a probability one half of being open and a probability one half of being closed. When you peer through the window, you gain one bit of information. We encode a bit in a physical system that can be in one of two possible states, such as a thumb that's pointing upward or downward. In a classical computer, a bit is encoded in a transistor that has the value one or the value zero. Quantum computer stores information differently. Before wading into the details of quantum computing, we should review a little basic quantum physics, namely entanglement. Here's a cartoon that reviews some key properties of entanglement. Imagine that some young physicist, let's call her Audrey, has a spin one half particle and her brother Baxter has another. The siblings can perform some operation on their particles that creates entanglement between them. Entanglement is a relationship that quantum particles can share and classical particles cannot. Entanglement can create strong correlations between measurement outcomes. 
suppose that Audrey measures whether her particle, let's say it's a spin one half particle, it has a spin pointing upward or downward. I'll label the possible outcomes one and zero. If the two particles are entangled maximally, she'll have no idea which outcome she'll obtain. So one and zero have 50-50 chances. Now, suppose that instead, Audrey measures her particle and Baxter measures his identically. The two siblings can predict something about the joint outcome. In one example, if the siblings have a singlet, then if Audrey obtains a one, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a zero. And if Audrey obtains a zero, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a one. Furthermore, there is a measurement that the siblings can perform jointly on the pair of particles together, such that the siblings can predict the outcome with certainty in advance. That measurement, measurement is a bell measurement. So there's something, some information that isn't in Audrey's particle, it isn't in Baxter's particle, it isn't in the sum of the two particles addressed independently. It's spread across the pair. When it comes to entanglement, the whole really is greater than the sum of its parts. Scientists and engineers are now leveraging entanglement in quantum information science. Quantum information science is the study of how we can use quantum phenomena to process information in ways forbidden for classical systems. Quantum information technologies include quantum computers, networks for communication, cryptographic systems, and more. Quantum computers will be able to solve in minutes certain problems that would take even supercomputers many years. Today's quantum computers are small and limited. Many of us expect that will take quite a few more years to build quantum computers up to their full potential. Applications will include information security. If you've purchased merchandise online, say through Amazon, your credit card information has been secured with a common cryptographic protocol. RSA encryption, named after the three MIT scientists who invented it, Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman. Classical computers can't break that safeguard in any reasonable amount of time to the best of our computer science knowledge. Quantum computers will be able to break the safeguard easily. On the other hand, quantum phenomena provide new resources for protecting information. In 2017, researchers in China and Austria conducted the first video conference encrypted with quantum resources. An important application of quantum computers will be research and development in material science and chemistry. As a thermodynamicist, I'm obliged to point out that one of the most ambitious potential applications is to energy use. Microsoft's quantum team detailed this idea. In some countries, food security is at crisis levels. In other countries, food security is at the highest levels ever in history. So fertilizer is extremely important across the globe. We invest about 3% of the world's entire energy output in fertilizer production. Why do we spend so much energy? because we produce fertilizer using an old technique from 1909. Bacteria can accomplish the same goal much more efficiently. But those bacteria use a molecule that's too complicated for us to simulate on classical computers. The molecule though is quantum. So a quantum computer will naturally be better suited to unlocking the molecule secrets and if all goes as hoped, and that's a very big if, transforming fertilizer production and energy use. Little wonder that governments across the world are pouring funds into quantum research, technology, and education. For example, in 2018, the United States Congress passed the National Quantum Initiative Act 
which provided $1.2 billion for quantum efforts. Even more astoundingly, the Senate passed the act unanimously. The Senate usually squabbles about everything, but everyone actually agreed on quantum efforts. Not only governments, but also loads of companies are investing in quantum science and technology. Here's an advertisement from Microsoft about its quantum products. Google, IBM, Amazon, and Honeywell have quantum teams. Quantum startups are booming. At least two have become publicly traded in the past few years. An example is Rigetti, whose team is shown here last March when the company debuted on the stock market. This subject belongs to IBM. This is not a quantum computer, although it looks cool enough to be one. Actually, some people think it looks steampunk because of the gold and copper and wires sticking out. This object holds a quantum computer, which fits on a small chip. The chip needs to be at low temperatures to support quantum phenomena such as entanglement. So this device cools the quantum computer to tens of millikelvin. This device, as you might know, is a dilution refrigerator known colloquially as a fridge. Actually, when my husband heard that, he's a classical computer scientist. He was kind of indignant. He said, this cools things down to below the temperature of outer space and you can't even call it a freezer. Anyway, cooling leads us to the third element in our triumvirate, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, the forms that energy can be in and the transformations amongst those forms. As a review, objects can transmit energy in two forms, heat and work. Heat is the uncoordinated energy of particles jiggling about randomly. Heat is disorganized energy and so isn't directly useful. Work is coordinated energy that can be directly harnessed to power a factory or charge a battery or raise an anchor. Heat engines convert random heat into coordinated work. Heat engines drove the Industrial Revolution by powering the first factories. People started wanting to know how efficiently engines could operate, so they developed the theory of thermodynamics, giving it a practical bent. However, the practical questions led to fundamental questions, such as why does time flow in only one direction, and do materials really consist of particles too small for us to see? The theory of atomism had not been entirely accepted by the Victorian era. Cooling, expelling heat, is a thermodynamic process. But how do you measure the heat emitted by a quantum system that's cooling down? You can measure the heat emitted by a classical system by measuring the system's energy, cooling the system, and measuring the energy again. The initial energy minus the final energy is the heat lost. But quantum systems are more delicate than classical systems. Heisenberg was the first to intuit that if you measure a quantum system, you disturb it. Robertson codified this intuition in 1929 in the uncertainty relation we learn as undergraduates. Thanks to uncertainty, if you measure a quantum system's energy, you probably change the energy. So how we can measure heat or even conceive of heat in the quantum setting is not straightforward. Furthermore, this fridge is a large classical system. What if we tried to build a fridge from a quantum system? Could we? How small could we make it? Could quantum phenomena such as entanglement benefit a quantum fridge as they benefit quantum computers? More generally, just as there are information processing tasks, such as encrypting information, there are thermodynamic tasks, such as refrigerating and powering cars and charging batteries. Given that quantum phenomena benefit information processing tasks, can they benefit thermodynamic tasks? 
How can we extend the Victorian theory of thermodynamics from large classical systems, such as steam engines, to small quantum and information processing systems? These questions underpin quantum thermodynamics, my field of research. This field shares its aesthetic, its spirit, with steampunk. Hence my calling this work quantum steampunk. How and when did quantum thermodynamics develop? The field has roots that stretch back to the 1930s. Right after quantum theory was formulated, people began wondering whether it could explain thermodynamic phenomena. During the 1950s and 60s, researchers designed the first quantum engine. It consists of one atom that you can use in a maser. As you probably know, a maser is like a laser, shown here in its all-important application of driving a cat insane. However, whereas a laser emits visible lights, a maser emits microwave radiation. The Adams Energy Ladder has three populated levels, zero, one, and two. So the atom has three energy gaps, zero, one, one, two, and zero, two. Each gap can exchange energy with a heat bath whose frequency is filtered. One bath is cold, one bath can have a negative temperature, and the final bath has an infinite temperature. We learned in statistical physics class that negative temperatures are accessible to a system that has a finite state space, such as a collection of spin one out particles. Temperature is the rate of change of energy with respect to entropy, or the inverse temperature is how quickly the entropy grows as the energy grows. Entropy is a measure of how big a state space is accessible. Consider a system of spins in a magnetic field. When all of the spins align with the field, the system has its lowest energy. Only one such configuration exists, the entropy is minimized. If all spins except one align with the field, then the system has a greater energy. The number of configurations is the number of spins you can choose to point downward. As the energy grew, the entropy grew. So the inverse temperature is positive. If all spins but two align, then the system has a greater energy and a greater entropy as the number of ways you can choose two spins from six to point downward is greater. This trend continues until half the spins point upward. The number of ways you can choose three spins from six maximizes the entropy. Then as the energy increases further, the number of configurations decreases back down to the number of ways we can choose two spins from six. The entropy decreases, so the inverse temperature is negative. So the temperature is negative. This negative temperature system has a lot of energy. Negative temperature systems are very hot. This negative temperature bath gives the atom energy, pushing the atom's quantum state to have a decent probability weight on the top level. The cold bath drops some probability weights onto the lowest level. The imbalance between the weights is eliminated by the infinite temperature bath into which the atom emits energy. Why? An infinite temperature system has its weights spread equally over the energy levels accessible. Moreover, the infinite temperature bath, upon accepting that energy from the atom, produces no entropy. The entropy produced equals the energy absorbed by the bath divided by the temperature. As the temperature diverges, the entropy vanishes, producing no entropy, no waste and disorder. The energy emitted by the atom serves as work. Turns out an engine doesn't need gears and cogs and other moving pieces. It needs only one atom. 
Moreover, the engine takes advantage of how quantum heat baths can have negative temperatures and so be especially hot. Henry Scoville and collaborators at Bell Labs designed this quantum engine between 1959 and 1967. Then, or since then, quantum engines have been designed to take advantage of quantum harmonic oscillators, squeeze state baths, phases of quantum matter, and more. But back to our historical tour. Over the decades after the first quantum engine was designed, thermodynamics had a small following. It wasn't seen as a discipline. Some people even said that quantum thermodynamics is an oxymoron. Thermodynamics was invented to describe large classical systems such as steam engines, so thermodynamics couldn't possibly have anything to say about quantum systems. However, over the past decade, quantum thermodynamics has experienced a boom. Here's a photo from my community's big annual conference in 2018. We met in Santa Barbara that year. That's why the scenery is gorgeous. We form an international community that has hotspots in the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Israel, Brazil, Switzerland, and elsewhere. A few of us quantum thermodynamicists work in the United States. Colleagues in many body physics, high end energy physics, and more are starting to incorporate quantum thermodynamics as a new twist into conferences, research programs, and grant proposals. In fact, colleagues and I established North America's first quantum thermodynamics hub centered at the University of Maryland last autumn. We aim to become the local watering hole for those curious about quantum thermodynamics, airing their best new results, and creating a community across North America and connecting with the rest of the world. Why has quantum thermodynamics been booming across the world? Quantum information science matured in the early 2000s. It came to offer a mathematical and conceptual toolkits for understanding quantum systems through how they store and manipulate information. Quantum information science also came to offer unprecedented experimental opportunities. Labs achieved exquisite control over tens to hundreds of thousands of atoms and ions. We've been using all these tools of quantum information science to build and test a theory of quantum thermodynamics. Here's an example. We'll start with a classical story that showcases the interplay between information and energy. Then we'll see what quantum physics has. We can store a bit of information, not just in a transistor, but also in a gas particle in a box. Suppose that the particle is classical, like a miniature basketball. This is a really, really simple gas. If the gas is on the box's right-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a one. If the gas is on the left-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a zero. By the way, this, this illustration, like some others we've seen, is by Todd Cahill. So Todd is a steampunk artist. He illustrated my book. He had no experience with quantum physics whatsoever, so the process was an adventure. But I think he crafted gorgeous illustrations, including this one. Suppose that we have no idea where the particle is. It can be anywhere in the box. Its position is totally random. Suppose we want to reset the particle's position to the box's right-hand side, a nice clean state. This is like taking a messy sheet of scrap paper that's been scribbled on totally randomly and erasing it to a nice clean state. To erase the bit encoded by the gas, we let the gas exchange heat with its surroundings, which have a fixed temperature through the box's walls. We slide a partition into the box near the left-hand wall and push the partition to the box's center. The gas ends up trapped in the right-hand side. At what cost? We compress the gas 
So we have to exert energy, namely work, the coordinated, useful type of energy that can be transferred between systems. The minimum amount of work required is Boltzmann's constant, appropriately for this conference, times the temperature, times log two. So we spend work to reset the particle's position or erase the bit of information. In other words, erasure, an information processing task, costs work, a thermodynamic resource. What's more, suppose that we want to compute and compute and compute and compute. Eventually, we'll run out of scrap paper. The universe doesn't contain an infinite supply of scrap paper, so we'll have to erase them. We just saw that erasure costs thermodynamic work. So computation has an intrinsic thermodynamic cost. When I first learned that in my first quantum computing class, the final spring I was an undergrad, I was staggered because a priori information and energy seem to have nothing to do with each other, but they turn out to be inextricably bound up. Rolf Landauer, an information scientist at IBM, realized this in 1961. The process that we just saw is therefore called Landauer erasure. Landauer was actually a skeptic of quantum computing he believed that large quantum systems would be so finicky, no one could ever control one well enough to build a quantum computer. My community intends to prove him wrong about whether quantum computers can work, but he does seem to have been right about the role of work in computing. What if we had quantum physics to this mix of information and energy? The story can change in many different ways. I'll share one way discovered by colleagues of mine, including the Portuguese physicist, Lydia Del Rio. Suppose that we want to erase not a classical bit of information stored in gas in a box, but quantum bit, qubit, a basic unit of quantum information. A qubit is a quantum two-level system that can be in not only zero states, one state, but also in any superposition of these states. We can encode a qubit in a spin one-half particle, such as Audrey's particle from a few minutes ago. Audrey's qubit can be entangled with Baxter's qubit in some fixed temperature environment. Again, if Audrey's qubit is entangled with Baxter's as strongly as possible, and Audrey measures her qubits, she has no idea whether she'll obtain a one or a zero. The outcome is totally random. So Audrey's qubits resembles the gas particle bit, whose location, right or left, one or zero, is totally random. Just as we could erase the gas particle bit, Audrey can erase her qubit. My colleagues proved that Audrey can erase her qubit while gaining work that she can use to charge a battery or lift a tiny weight. This result should surprise us. Landauer said that we have to spend work to erase information. The trick is, to sort of burn the correlations between the qubits. Entanglement serves as a kind of thermodynamic fuel together with heat. So quantum phenomena, such as entanglement, can serve as resources in thermodynamics, in gaining work, as well as in information processing. Beyond erasing information, we can build quantum thermodynamic Engines, refrigerators, ratchets, and batteries. Quantum phenomena can benefit such devices, my community has found. We can use entanglement as a resource in refrigeration. We can charge quantum batteries at a greater power 
if we entangle them than if we don't. A quantum engine that, so to speak, burns information can perform more work on average than its classical counterpart. And quantum engines can operate under conditions in which classical engines cannot. These results not only help us extend Victorian thermodynamics into the 21st century, but also shed new light on what distinguishes the quantum world from the classical. If we gaze into the future of quantum steampunk, what do we see? First, this field has been gaining momentum and participation sight unseen over the past decade. I expect the field to continue this upswing and increasingly join the ranks of established fields of physics, such as astrophysics and elementary particle physics, and as of a few years ago, even quantum information science. Some of us quantum thermodynamicists are building bridges to long established disciplines. Just as quantum information science has offered a new lens onto other fields, such as thermodynamics, we're now using quantum thermodynamics to understand black holes and chemistry and more anew. So a first grand opportunity is to expand quantum thermodynamics far beyond its original boundaries. Second, quantum thermodynamics has its roots in theory. From quantum thermodynamics, we've gained fundamental insights into what distinguishes quantum from classical physics, what it means for time to flow, and more. But quantum thermodynamics is growing increasingly experimental. Experiments are testing the theory and sparking new theory. Personally, as a theorist, I've collaborated with four quantum labs over the past three years. One uses photons, one uses ions, and two use superconducting qubits. We have many options, and I expect us to take advantage of them increasingly. Most of the experiments happening now are proof of principle. They show that we can operate quantum engines if we try very hard, but those engines aren't practical. They perform less work than we have to invest in cooling the engines down and manipulating them. So a third opportunity is to make quantum thermodynamics practical. The original theory of thermodynamics went hand in hand with the industrial revolution, which was eminently practical. Quantum thermodynamics should go hand in hand with similar utility. For my part, I'm working with experimentalists in Sweden on a quantum refrigerator for cooling quantum computers. Suppose that the quantum computer inside this classical refrigerator has just finished up a computation. Its qubits are used up. To reset the qubits, we have to cool them even more. We can put a quantum refrigerator inside the classical refrigerator to reset the qubits. The experimental test of the theory actually took place last fall at Chalmers University in Sweden. Quantum thermodynamics is an incredibly dynamic emerging field. It is vibrant and growing. It offers both fundamental insights and technological possibilities. If you'd like to learn more from my book, you can obtain a discount by using this code while ordering directly from Johns Hopkins University Press. Otherwise, it's available through the usual venues. When I was a master's student back in Waterloo, Canada, I read about steampunk in a novel. But this genre of fiction is coming to life at the intersection of quantum physics information science, and thermodynamics. The fantasy of steampunk is becoming reality. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nicole, for this fantastic uh, talk. Uh, 
I found out too late about your discount code. I bought your book without the discount, <laughs> <laughs> but I can really recommend it. It's very fantastic. And uh, maybe I'll, we have here a really, how do you say, veteran of quantum steampunk and his Haruo Kawahara. I doubt you know Haruo, uh, Nicole. Do you know Haruo? Haruo. No. I, I, I'm just asking him to unmute here. And uh, he, uh, Haruo Kawahara, we are so lucky uh, that he joined us here. He is an uh, amazing person. You know, in, in his youth or uh, some time ago, he was a nuclear power station engineer in Japan. And his software is still running. Uh, the Japanese is still in use. The software he wrote is still in use in, in uh, Japan's nuclear power stations. Correct me if I'm wrong, Karu. And then later, when I met him, he was the CEO of uh, Kenwood. And maybe, uh, Nicole, you know Kenwood. Kenwood is a Japanese electronics company, which uh, I, when, uh, uh, when Haru became CEO, they, were, they had, I think, 32 business units, and they went bankrupt. And Haru rebuilt the company into a very profitable, successful company. And he can tell us more. And now he's an investor now. He's, he's a, a venture investor now. Invests between Israel and in, in quantum steampunk companies. <laughs> Haru, uh, maybe you can explain a bit more. And, and also, if you have questions, please ask uh, Nicole about today's steampunk. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm very interesting about that uh, quantum uh, the theory. Uh, today, uh, I learned very much, uh, not only the, for some uh, computing area, but also the, some dynamics area. So uh, I had been working in the General Electric San Jose Nuclear Energy Division. Uh, 1967, uh, uh, and uh, I uh, had uh, been working in uh, software development uh, for the nuclear power station. I, th I think still now in uh, uh, down the Chicago uh, near the Kankakee River uh, named Dresden Nuclear Power Stations, uh, my uh, computing software uh, it's working uh, in that uh, nuclear power station. So uh, such a very uh, advanced technology is my uh, let's see, uh, exciting uh, one. And uh, I'm asking uh, Nicole uh, that uh, uh, the, I understood that uh, the recently the quantum theory uh, is going to apply uh, the new computing systems. But uh, uh, what is the most, uh, how to say, uh, the uh, difference between the, the, uh, the current uh, uh, the computing system, one zero uh, systems, uh, and uh, also, uh, this uh, quantum system is how to apply the new uh, energy or engine systems. So I'm very much uh, interested about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question in the background. Um, quantum computers, instead of being having just bits that can be in the zero state or one state, can be in any superposition of zero and one, and also the quantum bits can be entangled. So they can share stronger correlations than any ordinary bits can. Quantum computers we expect are good for first and foremost, simulating quantum systems. A huge amount of energy nowadays goes into simulating materials in research and development, but some of those, a lot of those materials are quantum, whereas are they're being simulated by classical computers. And classical computers um, aren't well suited to 
to simulating qu uh, quantum systems because they basically don't have enough memory. And so if you can use a quantum computer to simulate your quantum system, then you tend to need exponentially less memory. So you went out there. So people are looking to applications of quantum computers in chemistry and material science, also high energy and nuclear physics to understand what's really going on with nuclear forces. And as an alternative to uh, giant experiments such as the LHC and CERN, we could potentially simulate quantum field theories, uh, elementary particle physics on quantum computers. Also, optimization problems are expected to be able to, we're expected to be able to get approximate solutions to optimization problems um, better on quantum computers. But people are looking into optimization problems in all sorts of industries because there are all sorts of supply chains and transportation networks and so on that involve optimization problems. In addition to using quantum technology for things like cryptography. Thank you very much. I'm very much exciting. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there's uh, Davide maybe, Davide Otenga, he works for the German optical company Zeiss. Uh, Davide, do you have questions, Davide? Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. Um, so unfortunately, I, I joined only later on for the second part of the presentation. So I, I don't have any specific questions in this case. It was interesting to to hear sort of the connection right to to quantum computing but i didn't uh, really right uh listen to the first okay. part of the presentation no problem well uh thank you very much nicole for this fantastic talk and oh me. i have one uh, one question which is goes right to the beginning of your talk which is really about the quantum uh, about the quantum uh, uh, steampunk issues and these visionary issues. You didn't mention Jules Verne. I'm sure you must uh, uh, know Jules Verne. Yes, he was another early steampunk writer. Yeah, you I didn't I had a, a place. Yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have time to cover all of steampunk. Yeah. That would take a whole other talk. So <laughs> I I picked H.G. Wells because I think he might have written steampunk a little bit earlier, starting a little bit earlier than Jules, Jules Verne, but they were approximately at the same time. Okay, there's a pizza place in Tokyo, which is inspired by his novel on the submarines, you know, his uh, uh -huh. novel, so it looks... Yes, like I should visit when I visit Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for your fantastic, enthusiastic talk, and I really admire your work, and I'm very much looking forward to next year. You know, this was this year's Ludwig Wartsman event here yesterday and today. Uh, I used as a kind of test balloon for the first time, and I already have uh, a, a very interesting people who are interested to uh, jointly organize and, and speak and, uh, next year. So, That's and fun. your idea is to celebrate the second, a uh, 200th anniversary of the second law. Um, so I think that will be very exciting and, and let's yes. be in contact and organize this. And Sounds thank good. you so very much. Take care. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. Bye exciting. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Very interesting. Bye-bye.